You're listening to Talk Line with Zev Brenner, America's premier Jewish broadcast on the air since 1981. And now, here's your host. Welcome back to the program. I'm Zev Brenner. We're continuing our series of looking of who would like to be governor of the great state of New York. And joining us right now is Harry J. Wilson. He's an American businessman, former investor, turnaround expert. He served the United States Department, Treasury Department under Barack Obama. He originally ran for control of New York, and now he put his hat in the ring to be governor of New York, running in the Republican primary. So, Harry, thank you for joining us. Great to be with you, Zab. Thanks for having me. Thank you. So I know you're a relatively late comer to this race. What made you decide you're a successful businessman? You've run before. What made you decide to enter a crowded field and vie for Republican leadership as far as being governor of New York? Sure. So I think there are two really important things. The first is I've spent my entire business career, nearly 30 years at the highest levels of American business, driving the turnarounds of failed companies, companies in or near bankruptcy that had been failed by mismanagement from the past and threatened the lives and livelihoods of, uh, of the hardworking employees in the company. And I think that's exactly the skill set we need as a governor in the most failed and broken state government in the country, in New York. So that's the first piece. Uh, the second piece is I'm the only Republican that's come close to winning in the last 20 years statewide. When I ran for controller, as you mentioned, in 2010, I almost beat the popular incumbent, Tom DiNapoli. No one else has come within 13 points of winning. Uh, and so that combination of both the skill set to succeed as governor, not just say no to the other side, not just manage the decline, but actually fix the most broken state government in the country. And then secondly, the ability to actually win by building a broad coalition and appealing to a broad uh, swath of voters, which we need to do to win in New York. Uh, that's, those are two unique skill sets. And as um, what happened is as the field progressed, the state party has been trying to get me to run for governor for many years. And it's never really worked for me and my family and my business. It's, you know, I'm not a politician looking for a job. I'm, I'm someone who wants to make a difference in all things I do, but I've got to balance my, my family priorities and my other priorities. And so in the past, I'd said no. But then in uh, early 2022, a lot of people came to me and said, look, the, no disrespect to the gentleman running, but they're not going to be able to win and they're not going to be able to pull off what you can do. You need to, to reconsider to see once in a generation opportunity to fix our state. Uh, and that's what really got me to start thinking about it and led to my ultimately entering the race. Now, some candidates have been running for a while. You entered late in 2022, as you mentioned. So on the one hand, that's one advantage because you have you can come in as a new entry, but on the other hand, other people have laid the groundwork for themselves. So how do you, with pretty much as a latecomer, how do you capture the lost time? Yeah, no, it's it's uh, one of the things we had to ask ourselves is, is it uh, do we have the time to capture the lost time? And there are some things we haven't been able to do as much as we would like to. Um, we will, uh, assuming we win the primary during the course of the general election, that'll give us plenty of time. I entered the race at the same time I entered the race for controller 12 years ago. So it won't have any impact on the general election, but for the primary, there were some things we had to do less of just because of the time constraints. And the way we really try to do that is one, I did have a pretty good political base from people who knew me from the past. I have a great network within the, within the uh, New York business community, all of whom were enthusiastic about my running. Uh, and then the other piece is just kind of, you know, working 18 plus hours a day, seven days a week to try to um, catch up, which I think we've done. So those are the, the main things we've done. Obviously, we've done um, heavy advertising, not so much in the New York City market, but upstate where we think we've really built a very comfortable position. Um, I, I'm the only person who grew up upstate in the race. I grew up in a, a small town in Johnstown, a uh, working class Greek immigrant family who came there from Greece. Uh, and um, that I think is that combination is how we'll be able to try to build on the fact that other people have been running for a long period of time. In New York, I, I think there are probably more Republicans than people within. I think places like Staten Island, parts of Brooklyn, even mm -hmm. parts of Manhattan. So you're not neglecting us in New York City, are you? No, no, of course not. No, no, it's just a, it's just a question of priorities and, and strategy, you know. And so, no, I mean, I you know, like I live in Westchester and Scarsdale now. Um, so, you know, I've worked for years in New York City. So I certainly know uh, the New York City market well. And, you know, I've got a great base of support amongst New York City Republicans. It's just a question of strategy. So if you think about it, 65% of primary voters live north of the Bronx. 14% uh, live in the five boroughs and the remainder in, in, in Long Island. And so we've, and obviously uh, one of my opponents has a, has a pretty strong base in the Eastern half of Long Island. And so we've been deliberate about where we want to focus and where we can build given the political realities of the field. I think some of your guys have been swinging against the Congressman Lee Zeldin, right? It's been pretty hard, hard and heavy. Have you gotten any flack for that? Because win or lose, uh, it could be hurtful to a Republican candidate in the general election. 
Well, let's make sure we understand the history here. So when I started looking at this in January, um, the state party was trying to cut a deal with, with Mr. Zeldin for an insider deal to, to preclude a primary. And Mr. Astorino and Mr. Giuliani said, no, we're not going to accept that. We're going to run a primary. And they were right. They got enough signatures to qualify, despite Mr. Zeldin's efforts to try to disqualify them from the ballot and disqualify me from the ballot. And so um, I said to the state party, you're going to have a primary. And that's been proven true. Um, and you want to have the primary have the best person, the best candidate, the best chance of winning and actually fixing New York to come out of that primary. So what you should do is set up a process where it's a fair process, where everybody gets a fair hearing and we stay positive. And I said, I would observe Reagan's 11th commandment throughout unless I was attacked. And if I was attacked, I was gonna return that fire fivefold. I think that's the only smart thing to do. I'm not gonna unilaterally disarm against people attacking me. Well, Congressman Zeldin started attacking me in January. I didn't announce until February 22nd. So he was attacking me for weeks before I even announced, before I even made a decision to run. And he did that because he knew I was the, the best shot at winning and he wanted to try to stop me before I got momentum, but that didn't work. And so we didn't actually have any criticism of him publicly until May, four months after he started attacking me. And yes, we've been doing it heavily because I said I was going to return it fivefold. Um, but I would have preferred what we what I said at the beginning. And if you notice, I've never criticized Mr. Astorino or Mr. Giuliani, nor have they criticized me because we've observed the 11th. Commandment. I noticed I was wondering why he was only against Lee Zeldin. I was wondering what about the other candidates? It did uh, rest my yeah. mind. Yeah, it's retaliatory. Like it's it's clearly because he's been doing it for four months and I'm not going to unilaterally disarm. Uh, and so, you know, I, I, if that's you know, it's like I said from the beginning, I was happy to observe the 11th commandment. Some of his supporters actually laughed at me when I suggested that. And I said, the reason I suggested it was not naivete. It's because I thought that was the way to have our party be strongest coming out of a primary. We just talked about each other's strengths, our, our own respective strengths and what we offered and our own visions and let the voters decide. And that's what I wanted to do. But again, I'm not going to uh, not respond to attacks. Um, and, um, and, you know, that's that's why we're here right now. Here's an interesting question. Unfortunately, the primary is June 28th. A lot of people are vacation minded. They're away. They checked out. I know we're in early voting. I understand that. But how do you motivate voters? Because in the Republican primary, you just, you just threw us more to the right than Democratic primary, more to the left. How do you motivate a base to come out? and support you considering that the number is gonna be unfortunately very low. Yeah, I, th and then I think it's a shame the way the primary process evolved, not because of anything on the Republican side, because of the Democrats in the legislature who had this you know, horrible gerrymandering uh, effort that was clearly unconstitutional, was tossed out, and then led to this bifurcated primary with governor and lieutenant governor and assembly on June 28th, and Congress and the state Senate on August 23rd. So that already hurts um, uh, turnout. It's confusing. As you said, it's the Tuesday of 4th of July week. People are away. Uh, school, Many schools just ended this week or about to end. Our, two of our kids will be wrapping up school this coming week. Um, and so it's it's horrible timing. And it's because the incumbents in Albany are not interested in democracy. They're interested in job preservation. And so we had said uh, that they should consolidate the primaries around a date that was more suitable and have everybody together. They didn't do that. Um, and so we just got to deal with the hand that we're dealt. Uh, and the hand that we're dealt is we've got to make sure that people understand that this is a really uh, once in a generation opportunity. I know politicians always say this is the most important election of our lifetime. And I'm, you know, honestly sick of that rhetoric. Uh, but but I mean, every election is every time I, I keep hearing, it, I say, this is very important. So. Yeah. And, and, and they are, they're always important. You know, that's why, I mean, we, our right to vote is one of our most fundamental American rights. So it is always very important, but you know, people tend to exaggerate it. But in this case, I'm voting with my feet. I've walked away from my business. I've put in $11 million of my own money, which is a lot of money to me. I'm working 18 plus hours a day, seven days a week, because I really believe deeply that this is our once in a generation chance to fix the state. Why do I say that? Because you need to have the ability to win and you need to have somebody who actually can fix the state. So to win, you need a red wave, which we have. You need a vulnerable incumbent uh, and Governor Hoko. That's the, this is the first time those two things have lined up since 1994. Um, the problem for us Republicans is there are 2 million more Democrats in the state now than there were then, and no more Republicans. Our party has done a terrible job of growing the party. Terrible. And that's why it takes a special candidate who can transcend party boundaries to really build a bipartisan coalition to actually win. Otherwise, we're just going to lose by 15 or 20 points again. And in, in the last 20 years, I'm the only person who's done that statewide.
Uh, and then the second piece of it is in addition to winning, you have to have somebody actually fix it because if all you do is win, say no to the other side, we'll lose in four years and never return to the governor's office. We have to do what was done, for example, in Massachusetts when Bill Weld fundamentally fixed uh, Massachusetts and set on a very different trajectory. And they've had 24 out of 32 years of Republican governors, despite an even more democratic state than New York is. So we need a governor who could actually succeed and transform the state who's proven it in his life. Um, and I, that's what I've done for 30 years, the highest levels of American business in really difficult situations with very entrenched stakeholders. We're sitting with Harry J. Wilson. He is a businessman. He is running for governor for New York on the Republican line from upstate New York. How important factor is Donald Trump in the Republican primary? Yeah, great opinion. question. He's always important. Like he's the leader of the party. He is uh, obviously the you know the most popular figure in the party by a lot. Um, and uh, you know he at this point has remained neutral in this race. I, I believe that will be continue to be the case. Um, but I think you know one thing I really focus on is what are the things that voters really. Um, loved about Donald Trump and supported him for. And I think it's because he was not a politician. He came in from the outside. He was beholden to nobody. And he took on a lot of entrenched interests that were clearly not serving the people of this country. Uh, and I think, you know, in my case, a very similar background in the sense that that's exactly what I'm trying to do is take on these entrenched interests. Now, my, my business background is different. He obviously was a very successful real estate developer. Um, in my case, I've spent my entire career fixing broken companies. And that's why I think that skill set is so appropriate and so necessary um, in a governor. But you have to take on a position of being pro-Trump or anti-Trump. Some candidates have been pushing that they're part of the Trump team or pro-Trump. Others are staying away. Where is your position? Are you on the pro-Trump camp, anti? You're staying out of the fray. How do you how do you uh, position yourself? Yeah, well, so for all things, I just kind of make decisions on a, on a decision by decision basis. I don't consider myself a blind loyalist to anybody, and I don't consider myself a blind opponent. You know, and so with the with the president, you know, I voted for him in 2016. I voted over Hillary Clinton. I support the vast majority of his policies. I've never been critical of him, but there are some things we disagree on. Um, like normal people, you know, Ed Koch used to say that if you agree with me on nine out of twelve things, vote for me. If you agree with me on twelve out of twelve, you should see a psychiatrist. And that's you know, I think that's common sense. I think most people understand that, but some people are trying to argue that there's a you know, blind loyalty to anything. The only thing I have a blind loyalty to is, is God and my personal faith. Um, you know, that's, I wouldn't even consider that blind. That's a learned loyalty over, over the course of my lifetime, but that's the only person who's infallible. Uh, and so, you know, for everything else, you know, I focus on making assessments on a, on a, you know, kind of case by case basis. Now, the Jewish community is certainly one that votes, and the Orthodox Jewish community especially has been voting more Republican and belong to the Republican Party. What is your relationship with the Jewish community? Sure. So I, um, you know, I think it's a, it's a great one. I, uh, you know, it started when, um, so I grew up in a, in a not terribly diverse small community, wonderful community in Johnstown, small town upstate New York, heavily Catholic and um, kind of white ethnic immigrants from Europe. Uh, including my family, came there from Greece. My dad's parents came there from Greece. And my mom came there from Greece. So I'm first generation Greek American. And I mentioned that because, you know, I had, it was, it was a you know, small community. And when I went to college, it was the first of my family to go to college. I went to Harvard. And that's when it really opened up my eyes and my life to a much more diverse set of friends and, and experiences. And so it just so happened that a lot of my closest friends in college were Jewish, uh, just for whatever reason. And um, a number of them were Orthodox. And so we would often have dinner together at Hillel. I usually go to Hillel was actually right next to my dorm and it had, uh, frankly, much better food than my dorm. And so, you know, I'd see them for dinner like three times a week. And I ended up going there so often that I was the only Christian on the kosher list at Hillel in college. Uh, and, and so that was, you know, that was my kind of first exposure to the Jewish community. Um, but I, because of that, you have know, some of my closest friends in life are Jewish and both and, and across the spectrum, Orthodox, conservative, reform, Hasidic. Uh, and, um, you know, so now you know, we live in Scarsdale today. I've been to, I don't know, 200 bar my mitzvahs probably in my life, some, some very large number. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's uh, obviously, a, you know, kind of wonderful and diverse community. And, and it's something that, I've, you know, through personal, my personal experience, I didn't do it for political reasons. These are all my, my, my lifelong, or not lifelong, my, my adult lifelong friends. Uh, and that's, um, that's a, so, so within that community, like, you know, I'd say that's the personal side, 
On the political side, I've always been very supportive of Jewish causes. I've been very active in fundraising for the UJA. A number of my friends are usually the honorees, uh, the annual honoree for various events is a personal friend of mine. So I was you know, very involved in, in helping support the UJA. Um, my Greek friends tease me that I've given more money to the UJA than I've given to Greek causes. <laughs> and so, um, so that's, uh, that's that. I've, you know, I've been involved in the World Jewish Congress, many other things. Uh, so it's, it, but it's all driven by my, my, my personal kind of relationships and, and friends. Now, I had asked Eric Adams right before he became mayor, and I asked him if he becomes mayor, will he establish a lot kosher kitchen in Gracie Mansion? He said, yes, I have it on tape. So my question to you is, should you become governor past the Republican and the general election, will you install a glad kosher ki kitchen in Albany? Absolutely. I think it's the right thing to do, but you also have a lot of friends I'd like to host, and I think that's a good way to, to do it. So absolutely. Now, you mentioned you have Jewish friends and you have great relationships. You're a supporter of UJA and I'm sure of Israel. But on the campaign trail, how was you? what kind of Jewish outreach have you done so far? Yeah. So you mentioned Israel. Let me come back to the, to the core of your question. But yeah, so in Israel, um, I actually been pro-Israel since I was a teenager. I was a 30-year member of APAC. My first APAC conference was in college, uh, was we went as a group of college Republicans. Um, and uh, and so longstanding, you know, obviously not terribly relevant for the New York governor's race, but just yeah, since you mentioned it. Uh, and in terms of the Jewish outreach has been mostly, again, through my friends. I've, you know, kind of longstanding friends in, in, in uh, Williamsburg, in Muncie, in Curious Joel. And so though they've been very helpful in making introductions to you know, both leaders there as well as other members of the community. And so it's been through that as opposed to kind of like we haven't yet hired, we will, um, if we won the primary, move on to the general election, um, you know, kind of direct coordinators for a number of different communities. Uh, we have not done that at this point because of the time we've had. Uh, but it's been so it's been through friends in those communities who made introductions to others. Harry, here is the toughest question of the interview so far. Are you ready? Yes. You have to go to a lot of different events, different ethnic groups. When you go to a Jewish event, what is your favorite Jewish food? <laughs> I don't know the toughest uh, question of the <laughs> you know it, it's it's well it's tough because it's hard to narrow it down right like I uh <laughs> I, I do like to eat and uh I would say my favorite uh is probably noodle kugel um I I love it you know uh so that's probably my favorite but I also you know, I've had a lot of matzo ball soup <laughs> you know I, I love chocolate babka um you know so it's uh, there's, a, there's a long list but if I had to narrow it down to one which is hard I'd probably say noodle kugel there's no wrong answer to the question. <laughs> now, with the moments we have left, there's so many issues affecting a crime, I think, is the number one. That's the issue that I think is going to draw the general election. And how much of it is a factor is in the Republican primer? Because I believe all the candidates are similar as far as prime is concerned. Yeah, no, it's absolutely right. Look, it's, it's a huge issue. And it's um, because the Democrats in Albany passed a series of terrible policies that have led us to reverse the great gains we had had and fighting crime across the state, particularly in the New York City area, but really across the state. And this is now because of those bad policies. This is the first time in my lifetime in 50 years, we've seen a statewide spike in crime across all communities, urban, rural, suburban, big cities, small cities. And it's, it's unquestionably driven by those bad policies. I think all four of us agree on that and would want to reverse the vast majority of those bad policies. Um, you know, I always say that the most uh, fundamental uh, mission of government is to keep people safe. That's why we formed governments in the first place centuries ago, and we're failing on that. So I think all of us agree that we would fight tooth and nail to fix those policies. In my case, the, the um, advantage I have is I will do that through the budget process. And that's how they were passed in the first place. That's how Cuomo and Hochul put them in through the budget process. And the way the budget process works is if the legislature does not pass it by March 31st, they don't get paid until they do. Well, I don't need to get paid. I will fight as long as it takes to, for the three pillars of my turnaround plan, which are reversing the anti, uh, the soft on crime policies, a 20% income tax and 20% property tax cut, total game changers for the people of the state and regulatory reform that um, removes the regulation to drive up the cost of food, energy, and housing unnecessarily. Those are all part of my first budget. Um, we will fight until we get it passed. I'll never compromise on those core principles. And we will get it passed in 2023. And by the end of the year, our state will be much safer, more prosperous, more affordable, and a much better place to live and work. But bail reform is not, I'm not, I don't know how much of impact the governor has to change bail reform. That's more of a legislative issue. But as long as bail reform is not going to be reformed back to the way it was, criminals are running loose. You have DAs. And I know you do have the possibility of firing DAs who don't yes. uh, do what you want them to do. But nevertheless, we're still seeing this. And as long as that's going to be changed, how do we correct that? 
No, we, we, we can actually through the governor. And let me, let me explain why. So the first principle, the first point in my uh, Make New York Safe anti-crime plan is uh, eliminate bail reform and specifically to give judges discretion, particularly around dangerousness. Now, the governor, uh, that's, you know, that, that was when they eliminated discretion three years ago, that was done through the budget process. And Cuomo pushed it and signed off on it. And I would do the opposite. I would say, I'm not going to sign a budget that doesn't eliminate, that does, doesn't restore discretion to judges. Uh, and so that's what I was talking about in, in terms of talking about the budget. So the governor actually has a huge role. Um, governor Hochul chose not to act on it. She had some extremely minor tweaks that had almost no impact um, as part of the budget. But and she's shown leadership and conviction around this hugely important issue. She could have gotten it done this year. And now we're paying the price because she didn't. And one of the other issues that is germane to our audience, of course, is tuition tax relief. And this is true of Jewish schools, Catholic schools, you name the religious schools, where it's a double taxation, because if you sent your child to public school, you'd be getting about $20,000, $25,000 value. In addition, you got to pay tuition on top of that. So yeah. what can be done to relieve yeshiva students, parochial school parents of this burden? Yeah, no, it's another great, great question. So I, education is one of my most important issues. That is a great equalizer. That's how I got to be a kid growing up in a working class community in Johnson and go to Harvard. Like it's, you know, my teachers and, and coaches in my public schools in Johnson were the difference maker in my life. And when you look at why that is, is because of local community control. The people in Johnson knew what was best. The families at Johnson knew what was best for their kids. And they focused on that. And that's true, whether it's a yeshiva or a Catholic school, is having real uh, locally driven control. Now, the way to do that is to create a voucher system that allows for people to be able to kind of make those choices because that allows you to, you know, because it makes it affordable. And so that to me is essential to driving long-term uh, success for communities and for kids. Uh, and that's how you deal with the issue of, you know, kind of the, you know, kind of un unfair balance on, uh, on, uh, on control for yeshivas. And the secondary issue, of course, is, you know, there is a movement and attempt to regulate the content of what yeshivas are allowed to teach. This would affect all religious schools also, but particularly for yeshivas. What's your position about the state? New York State wants to regulate what's being taught in Jewish schools. Yeah, that's, that's, it goes a lot to what I was just saying about local controls. I think like, you know, the communities need to be able to shape what they think is in the best interest of their kids. And you have, like, you know, I have a number of my friends that I work with are graduates of yeshivas. They are incredibly talented and smart, and they have, they have a slightly different, they have different curriculum than what I had, um, but doesn't make them any less prepared. In some ways, I, makes, I think it makes them more prepared for life. Uh, and so I think it's a testament to the system. And, you know, my general philosophy is that they broke, don't fix it. Like if, if it's working, there's no reason for the state to assert control. The control should lie at the local school level. What's your biggest challenge? Biggest challenge was just the fact that we only had, you know, we only declared uh, less than four months ago and we had a lot of catching up to do. Now, I think, I think we've done that. I think we're going to prevail uh, next Tuesday. I think it'll be close, but I feel very good that our message of getting out and what we can do for the state is getting through. What we found, Zev, is that people who know about us, we have a huge lead. The problem is most people, a lot of people don't know, don't know about us. And then that's, you know, it's up to us to get that message out. We and we found- to endorse you, right? Uh, yes, the Daily News endorses a number of other newspapers, a number of newspapers in Long Island and, and Congressman Zeldin's backyard endorsed us. Uh, and so I think it's driven by what we offer. It's so different from anybody else in the field. We just have to make sure people know, as long as people know it, we have a big lead. The, we just gotta get our message out more broadly so that people know it. But the question though is, it was such a short period of time as we mentioned earlier with vacation looming and people physically and mentally checked out, what can you do in the next number of days between now and primary day to motivate your base? What yeah. is your strategy? Yeah, so we have, and I'm not gonna get into the specifics as they're confidential as you might imagine, but we have a very targeted get out the vote strategy focus on the people we think are our, our best supporters. Uh, and we think that's going to be able to kind of make a big difference in making sure they're, you know, the people who are most supportive of us and know us best uh, show up on election day. Eric J. Wilson, we appreciate you being with us. Look forward to having you back again. And we certainly do need a change here in New York. Thank you, Zeb. Great to be with you. Thanks for listening. For continuous Jewish programs, hawklinenetwork.com. We're our 24-hour-a-day listen line at 641-741-0389. For past shows, you can find us on iTunes, Spotify, Amazon, YouTube, Instagram, and all major podcast platforms or jewishpodcast.org. Thanks for listening to the talklinenetwork.com.